teed off ranger, you know, when he found his dead dog. But he'd wait, he'd wait till those dogs right up to him and shoot him in the head. And uh, with that twenty two pistol. And uh, then he went from there on over, and they didn't catch him. He went to a little town called Rock Springs, and then got him a room in a hotel there that was probably built sometime in the 1800s. And uh, and that's where they captured him in that hotel in, in his room. And then he got, they put him in jail, and he went up, uh, he broke jail again, and he caught a freight train and went all the way to Wyoming, uh, Montana. Uh, what, what, not, what, Wyoming, Montana. He got to work, and he's a good horseman, a good, he, in fact, he worked in the prison rodeo, rode broncs and bulls and everything else. He's a good, good horseman and good with uh, li- uh, working livestock and everything. In fact, good with animals. They, the stories about him that, you know, that people said that uh, he could, be in the woods and the deer would come up and eat out of his hand. But, uh, no I've kidding. Seen that. What, what was the end result with the Seymour kid after you locked him up and you cuffed him? Because, like I said, I did 21 years in the New York City Police Department, so, and I have to truly admit, although I was an active cop, I never uh, locked up anybody for horse thievery. So what, what is, did that carry a heavy penalty? I mean, what actually happened to this guy after you steal someone's horses? And to be honest with you, uh, Ranger uh, Jackson, I'm constantly uh, – trying to cut the guests short because I have so much in common with them, but the fact that you track somebody for nine days over the open country is is truly uh, amazing to me as as uh, one law enforcement official to another. I, I find that extremely admirable. Well, sir, it's a, I don't know, when you're young and full of pee and vinegar, you know, you do a lot of, as you well know, having been a policeman, you, and of course, you, you know, when you're young, uh, you just a lot more durability, and, and but if you get your mind made up, you're going to do something, you go do it, so you, so you uh, can't go any longer, you know, or something. But anyway, I I was lucky that that I and what I tried to do is stay out ahead of him. I, I tried to uh, outguess him. And when I'd find a place he had hit, well, I I try to had him out, try to figure out where they'd look and see where the next cabin was and where water was, and because so so when you're hunting man like that. He's, he's got to have food and water, and because uh, he'd get his food from burglarizing those cabins, and uh, and also he's armed. He, he'd also kill small game, kill a rabbit or something like that. He did. Yep. But but anyway, uh, I try. Well, when you got a man out, and if you, you can, you try to get out in front of him. You can figure out the direction he's taking, and you're cutting sign on him, and figure out the direction he's taking where he may go for the next water hole or the next. Uh, place where a cabin where he can get some food, you try to get out in front of him and, and wait for him and, 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 and uh, ambush him there, you know, and catch him there. Instead of, because uh, otherwise, uh, you know, if, if you don't get out ahead of him, he's going to ambush you, you know. Absolutely. And that's just, a, that's just an average everyday uh life of a Texas Ranger, being being on the hunt for like uh, like somebody like that. And as you said before, the best type of hunt is a man hunt. And, uh, I remember chasing perps, uh, like I said, trying to uh, dig up evidence and basically track down uh, uh, violent perpetrators. But as far as chasing anybody across open country like that, like I would do uh, different searches, hotels, like you said, short-stay hotels, which they have in many big cities. Uh, Where would you go and find shelter, food? Because that's every man's necessity to get shelter and food. But uh, to do that over the open country, I just find truly amazing. I really do. Well, I'll tell you what amazed me is, is New York City. I went there one time when I was going through the FBI Academy at Quantico. There was a, we had a, a police officer, a deputy sheriff, Long Island, and they had a sergeant, and I can't remember his name. Uh, I've got it at home, but I can't remember. He was a sergeant, and he was uh, he was in uh, uh, in the precinct where the uh, uh, where most of all the blacks live, what's uh, Harlem. He was he was a sergeant in Harlem, and so. One of the nights we were there was just a weekend on Saturday night. When he asked me if I'd like to go look around, I said, sure. So, And I'm going to tell you, you know, that's a jungle. You know, you talk about oh, yep. being out in the open. And I'm out in the hill country with lots of trees and brush and, and the hill and stuff like that. But I'd a hell of a lot rather be out there is being that, in, in those, all that brick and sidewalk and, and stone and iron and everything, all them buildings and everything crammed together. I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a jungle. And it's not just necessarily, it's other places too, as you well know in New York, but 
that to me it seems to be more dangerous to a law enforcement officer than tracking a man uh, out in the, out in the country. Uh, but but anyway, we with that night I never will forget. Uh, they had y'all had at that time some kind of special force that reacts to when officers shot or officer down or shooting taking place with officers that they they were driving they were in suburbans carrying equipment with them and stuff and. And they, they, what, what y'all call them? They, they reacted to a response team. It's emergency service. Yeah, it was back then. That was in 1976, and they had a special name for them. But they didn't. They weren't just limp. They'd go to the whole city of New York, Bronx, Brooklyn. So TPF, tactical, tactical patrol force. Yeah, that's it. There's something like that. And they had, okay. they had all the weapons that they'd need. You know, the type of weapons they had and stuff. It, so any one of these officers, he, they was there. We were there in Harlem. He says, "You want to go in, go in with me? I'm going to make a little run through this old hotel here in Harlem." I said, "Sure, I'll go with you." He said, "Are you armed?" I said, "Yes, sir. I'm always armed." So we went in and walked in that. Ho- we come through that hotel door, and I looked over there, and there was this black guy sitting behind the bulletproof uh, the desk where he normally where you go register in a hotel. It had flat bulletproof glass all around it, all around it. And I thought to myself, this is not a good place to be. You know. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> anyway, so anyway, we he's come on, so we went and it didn't have any elevator, we went up the stairway there. We before we started up the stairway, that officer unsnapped his pistol, unsnapped his uh 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 snap on his strap on his uh old side arm. Point. Yeah, he was carrying a revolver at that time. That was in 70, 76, 70, 76 or 78. A 38 six shot revolver, yep, Smith & Wesson. That's what he was carrying. So he unsnapped that pistol and reached the gun to put his hand on the butt of that pistol. And he stopped and he looked up in the stairways and I was standing back behind him. And we went up and every time that stairway would make a turn, well, he'd stop and look up. It. And we went down through and knocked on a couple of doors. And there we'll get, there's a bunch of drug addicts in there. And there was one guy, the guy came to the door was a white guy, which was a big surprise to me, but he looked, he looked like death warmed over. He's a drug addict. But he was in the room and had a, a big black guy was in there with him. And, uh, but that officer, when that guy opened that door, that officer stuck that 38 right, right under his nose and backed him right back in the room, you know. And, and oh, yeah. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, that's how they have to live. Otherwise, you know, the officer's not going to live very long. You know, it, it's funny you brought that up and you stated the uh, year was uh, 1976 because we have a, a, a listener on the show. His name is Jim Cook. He's also an author, and he wrote the book The Man Behind the Tin. And uh, he was involved in the stakeout squad. Now, what the stakeout squad was, it's like you said, it was a special squad of police officers. And he worked for the New York City Police Department from 1963 to 1980, and whenever he calls the show, and he calls the show often, in fact, if you're listening, Jim, give us a call at 347-945-5285, I'll have the producer put you right through so you can speak to Ranger uh, Jackson, when he calls in, I'm just truly amazed at the style of policing back then as compared to now, because he used to go out with grease guns, and they used to go out with their choice of firearms, which were a lot more effective, and to tell you the truth, when they came into a neighborhood, they put the fear of God in the criminals. Much like, I guess, when they see a ranger roll up on a, on a scene. Isn't there an expression, uh, Ranger uh, Jackson, one ranger, one riot? Yes, sir, but, you know, that, that, was, that was a truism up until civil rights. And, and, I, and God bless civil rights. I'm, you know, I think we should have civil rights in this country. I don't, I don't think any man's civil rights should be violated unless he's the enemy of the, of the state. You know, I mean... I don't believe in civil rights. These terrorists and the people that are trying to kill all of us you know, that hate us, I don't. I, I, they, they don't have any civil rights as far as I'm concerned. It's like in combat, in military combat. And yep. But, but but the citizens of this country do have civil rights, and thank God for that. And and officers appreciate that and respond to it. Absolutely, but but th- those were different times. Those those were truly different times back then. Uh, Ranger, uh, with, without a doubt. I, I'd like to ask you about one more thing, and then we'll open it 